So uh, Kate and her husband Tobin were at our house yeah. how many days ago? Maybe, well, it was nine Airstream days ago. So explain how you got here. Uh, very slowly. <laughs> we like, left DC. We've been uh, renovating. Soundtrack to Saving Private Ryan. Uh. <laughs> I feel like I should be demetaling right now. <laughs> I'm just gonna leave my decorative necklace. Uh, we uh, we bought a, like a 1984 Airstream that looked like my childhood, and I've been slowly stripping it down and building it back up Mennonite style, which is to say you only use family members for construction work. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and then we just kind of slowly drove all the way from DC here, and didn't realize, for example, that the Mountain Pass is not for trailers. So, to warn many you. a journey. <laughs> it's been good. Okay, but you made it. You look great. Uh, everybody's happy. Yeah, all intact. Okay, yes, good. thank you. Uh, so let's do the, the background story. Sure. Just um, the last uh, few decades of your life. Yeah, it all began. <laughs> the year was 1980. Um, sure. Uh, well, I was... I am Canadian. I'll just bring that in every two or three minutes, as all Canadians do. Um, <laughs> I really wanted to be a professor my whole life. My parents are academics and just nice little do-gooders. And I put myself on the academic super train, which is to say that every one of our bathrooms had a full bookshelf, which is completely unsanitary. Um, <laughs> but my life had this really direct momentum. All I wanted to do was to get the PhD, and then it was to get tenure, and then it was to be loved by the 200 members of my field, and, and just to do all the shiny, straightforward things um, that you think you want when you think you have endless amounts of time. So I spent my 20s just ruining uh, most family vacations, becoming the expert in the American prosperity gospel which is the, it's a subset of American Christianity that dominates most of 24-hour Christian programming and the belief that God wants to reward um, any faithful person with health and wealth. So that was the thing I knew more than anything else and, uh, and wrote a book about it called Blessed, A History of the American Prosperity Gospel, which I only recommend my parents reading. Um, <laughs> And then I started getting like weird pains in my stomach uh, when I was about 35 and I thought maybe it was just my gallbladder. And so I started just going to test after test. And at one point it hurt so much that I used my healthy outdoor voice with the doctor and insisted that I get a scan. And then I just went back to work like I always do. And then out of the blue one day in my office, I got a call from a physician's assistant to tell me that I had stage four cancer and that I would just have to go to the hospital right away. And that was kind of the end of this life I had pictured for myself that had one straight line that I thought was gonna lead to something kind of special. When Kay was at our house, I had to go get a box of tissues. I feel like we're gonna need it. <laughs> no, everything's fine, everything's great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I want to get actually get back to the prosperity gospel just yeah. to, to see how this all this all figures in. But first, I want to ask about the call. Why is it a medical technician or a, an assistant doing making that call? Um, I have found so there. Are, I feel like this, this the disclaimer is like there are so many doctors that I love. I love doctors. Uh, I have found the medical system to be a maze that I have really struggled to find care inside of. So usually I have gotten a very bizarre kind of patient treatment. So the person that tells me that I have cancer is somebody's tech assistant. And the person who tells me that I only have a 30% chance of living is the intern who comes in at 4 a.m. when I'm by myself. And all I could think of to say was like, oh man, you'd better be holding my hand if you're gonna say something like that. And I think uh, we were both practicing being human in a system that doesn't always know how to allow people their humanity. My first Aspen panel this festival, which seems like 600 years ago, <laughs> was um, a, a doctor telling me that the average treatment, uh, physician-patient contact is eight minutes, oh. and this, the patient gets to talk for 16 seconds before being interrupted. <laughs> so um, That but, sounds right. So we're, we're going to come in and out of your story, but sure. let's talk about the prosperity gospel and really 
its picture of human nature and, and yeah. how it aligns with the reality as you've experienced it. Well, yeah, it was, um, I like puzzles, like hidden in plain sight kind of puzzles, which is why I like being a historian. Um, and so I noticed that there was this subset of Christians who seemed to be saying what everybody else secretly believed, which is that they were entitled um, to health and wealth and longevity. And the people who uh, preached it just tended to be one of the most despised religious subsets in American culture. So I was like, well, that's a fun distinction. Um, so I, I went around creating a kind of elaborate um, spreadsheet of, of networking all the mega churches and then interviewing all these Christian televangelists to figure out how they became this enormous Christian conglomerate. And also they were most of the cheap paperbacks you find at Walmart. So how could they be, how could they have flooded the culture with such a compelling message that every good thing will always be rewarded? So I looked at the different strands that comprise the religious movement from something we call new thought, which is a religious movement that says that your mind is the most powerful thing about you. Like your brain is a spiritual incubator that, that causes your words to create spiritual forces. So like just as God says, like let there be light and there is light. Then so two people can speak positive things into reality. And all you have to do is say, go skiing in Aspen like I did at Christmas and tell a funny story about how you almost died going down the hill and then try to return your skiing equipment and you tell the funny story, and then the guy at the ski rental says, like, oh, don't bring those bad vibes in there. And I was like, oh, new thought, thank you. I study this. Um, so new thought is, is really powerful in popular culture, combined with a certain form of Pentecostalism. And then the other strand is just American bootstraps. So, I mean, we do, prosperity gospel or not, sort of have a belief that input leads to output, practice makes perfect, yes. good leads to good. Yes, that's right. How do you think about that right now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's so deeply compelling, especially for those of us who are trying to find agency in our lives. Um, a lot of people who've done incredible things did it with diminished circumstances, and they just found that little sweet spot that helped them get back up again. And I think that's one of the most powerful stories we can tell each other, where we help each other set our horizons and that's, I think, a lot of what Prosperity Gospel does for people. It says, um, get back up. Tomorrow is going to be a better day. The best is yet to come. And it's a beautiful thing when you're not sure if maybe your best is behind you or no one ever told you that you could believe in yourself. It's deeply compelling. The problem is, is that it's also inadvertently incredibly cruel for those who have a chronic illness, or they can't always be the one to live their best lives now because they're caring for somebody else. I mean, there's so many ways that our lives are defined by our loves for other people, aging parents, sick and disabled children. We're all bound up in other kinds of things that limit us in a culture that says that you are unlimited. And I think that can be really exhausting. Now, how did um, this diagnosis change your perception of time? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing because it was really morbid for a bit. Um, yeah, I think, well, I don't know if it's just anyone in their 20s and early 30s, but they're, you just keep putting into a system that you imagine is going to yield some kind of result. So, you know, you're, any kind of suffering means that later on you're going to be lying on a beach. And, uh, and I, had, I, had, I can tell now that I'd paid in too much. Like, I'd, I'd always ruined Christmas by just having one more article to write, or the vacation was like a vacation. <laughs> it just meant I brought a laptop to a place that was not conducive with so much sand. Um, <laughs> so the, the second I got sick, I mean, at first we thought, I got sick in, in September, and we thought I had till June. And that was a completely different way of thinking about seasons. Because like, everything was suddenly um, so much more beautiful than I'd ever realized. And that was maybe like bizarre to say, like the most unbelievably enriching thing about experiencing the limitations of time is everybody and everything became spectacularly beautiful to me. So, you know, you're like poor, sad parents that you're like, oh, wait, you are charming. <laughs> you know, you're like, you're just like all this stuff. You're like, maybe I am annoying. <laughs> so, <laughs> you kind of grow up into this different sense of what your life has mean, meant to other people and how grateful you are to have been 
loved, you know? So that was, that was intense. And I, I got used to a very short horizon. Like the second I got sick, I had two month scans, which meant I only had 59 days to live. And then they would do a scan and then they would figure out if they were gonna kick me off the drug that, I, that cost $16,000 per infusion to get. And almost immediately, you know, I grew up lower middle class, like a lot of people, and I knew right away that this was gonna bankrupt my family. So it was in this very tight, very limited, sort of financial and temporal economy. And describe where you are right now. Oh, crushing it, just joking. Um, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I, so I get these different, I kind of define my life by scans. So I used to be on a two month scan, which was rough. And then um, I've graduated to six month scans, which is an unbelievable effort in immunotherapy, so. And for that, I am in awe of immunotherapy and clinical trials that work and doctors who put in more time than they had to. So yeah, that's been, um, that's been amazing. And that's been a kind of transition from like crisis to chronic. So instead of the high drama of it, I live in a, in a sort of not fully, I don't have like the sunset horizon where I just imagine I can sprint forever but I'm grateful to live inside something that has a lot of possibility there. Yeah. Now, you, you've written about this a fair bit. You've speak, spoken about this. You have a podcast. And yet, I never get the sense it's become, that the emotions have become, have settled down. But. Sure. Well, I guess, um, I guess that was kind of the big surprise, was that there was a before and there was an after in my life. And I'm not, it took me a while to realize I'm not trying to get back to before. Like I'm not trying to get back to that experience of invincibility. I'm not trying to get back to that sort of blaseness that I had where I would go on a trip and I'd always assume that I would go there again. And there was a flatness with which I began to consume my life. And I'd, like, like I was a series of small appetites, you know, like never full. And I, part of it, the desire to talk about it or to have a kind of national conversation about what it means to not always be curable is that I don't want to lose touch with what it feels like to recognize my own fragility and then to be able to be open to the fragility of the people around me. Now, all of us are either before or after. Yeah, right? yeah. And from my perspective, you being after, it, you have a perspective and a wisdom that those of us who are still before don't have, does it feel that way to you? Only when I'm being uncharitable or if it's like a, I'm watching a reality show and um, one incredibly attractive person looks to the other and says that everything happens for a reason and there's only 12 people in that cast, so it probably wasn't super surprising that they ended up together. Um, <laughs> like, I don't know, I think maybe it's more a correction of my own thinking. Like. I think I thought that everyone was as durable as I wanted to feel, that everybody was on this path to invincibility. And now I can just see that that's a complete fabrication. I, I don't meet anybody that doesn't have something really intense that's, that's taking a part of their lives apart. An aging parent or a recent diagnosis of a friend or a setback at work. I think we're all just a lot more fragile than I realized. Now, when somebody has a diagnosis like yours or, or a tragedy almost of any kind, those of us who are outside the circle um, don't know what to say. <laughs> and I've also perceived those to whom the, the trauma is happening become very sensitive that other people say, that what other people say reflects the immensity of what they feel. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So how, how to, A, how do you, should we communicate into your life? <laughs> what do I say next but time I see you? me personally. Yeah. This is a master class <laughs> in me. Thank you. <laughs> no, I get that. I think maybe one of the weirder parts is this thing that we're so good at, which is relating. Like, oh, I also love the color blue, is like actually the worst instinct when it comes to someone else's tragedy. Like, oh, this is also about me. It's not the right reaction. <laughs> so it took me forever to realize that everybody's like, oh, my aunt had that. And she passed away. So, well, ah, like, why are the ants doing so poorly? Um, it took me a while to realize, like, such a deep desire to build the bridge is also this thing that immediately made me feel like I was on the other side of glass. So, 
Yeah, deep relationality is hard to build, especially when someone seems so altered by their, you know. I think that, I mean, I, I'm sure it happens to people in situations that are far more common, like uh, losing a job or a divorce, any kind of major transition. There's like desire to approach and then the immediately desire to backpedal. <laughs> or the, the most, I mean, I always know when someone knows about me because they have like what I call cocker spaniel face, where their head immediately turns to the side and it's just like, no, <laughs> and I'm like, no, stop pitying me. Um, I, the struggle is to always feel like you were the person you were before, like more than one thing. So allowing people the acknowledgement, but without trying to explain it away is a tricky, it's a tricky relational business. This is a slightly different case, but and I had a friend whose daughter was killed in Afghanistan. Yeah. And I asked, I wanted to know, how do I talk, talk to you? Yes. And should I, men and she said, some people sometimes say they shouldn't mention Anna because they'll remind me of something that's bad in my life, the loss of my daughter. Yeah. And she said, but they should know Anna is always on my mind. Mm. And if they mention it, it gives me the opportunity to come back or not. Yeah. And at least they brought it up. Yeah. 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 Is it all parallel? Is it sort of a different no, case? No, I'm sure that's true, though. The acknowledgement is such a big thing. Um, cause I, I mean, I lost a lot of friends almost immediately mm -hmm. just cause it was, I mean, I think also I like in their defense, I was everybody's first try a tragedy, <laughs> like, <I was> like, <laughs> right, you know, so they're in their thirties and like, they're just getting started with a sad train. Um, <laughs> so I think in that way, people probably do age into more of a variety of human experiences. Um, but yeah, I think there's such a desire to relate and also just to know, though, that that person feels fundamentally different than the person they were before. And they're not always able to pretend as effectively as other people. Anna's, Anna's mom said that um, there were firemen and there were builders. The firemen came right away. Yeah. And the builders came weeks later but stuck around for a while. That's nice. Um, which, and she said it was almost non-overlapping. Oh, interesting. And she also said that the people who showed up, some of her best friends did not show up. Yeah. But some people she didn't know at all showed up. Yeah. And so it yeah. was weirdly unpredictable. Did you think about whether to be a writer or be a public person about this? No, no. I was just very angry. Um, so I think partly why I started writing was um, I, I didn't realize how thick the cultural scripts around suffering are. And so, you know, like when it comes to the people you love, I mean, not, not all of it is trying to be disingenuous. Like I wanted to be able to say... Um, everything's going great. I'm sure there's going to be another. I'm sure we can afford it. Like you're, you're, you're saying all the things that you hope will eventually be true and you're trying not to hurt the people that love you most because you feel in that moment like you're the worst thing that ever happened to them. So you lie to each other <laughs> and then they say, oh honey, it's going to be great. <laughs> and then together you pat each other on the back and quietly go into your own rooms. Um, so some of it is 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 deeply loving. And then the rest of it is just that we live in this culture that seems unable to um, allow people to suffer without trying to explain them. So everywhere I went, and I, I, I'm like friends with, you know, academia is too smart for its own good. And so I was surrounded by people who just wanted to just Google the hell out of my symptoms. <laughs> so there was an endless desire to wonder what I ate or to ask about my family's genetic history. Of course, none of that is terribly useful often. Very sensitive. <laughs> yes. But like maybe if I explain it and I give you this information. So that was one common response. Um, the other was the endless, but have you tried, in which they've just recently seen a documentary that they very much want you to understand the contents of. <laughs> and, uh, and a lot of it was... Um, if you happen to know a third cousin who's into essential oils, that's also an excellent time to, <laughs> to stop opening your mail. Um, so all these kind of efforts to explain and then to help, but it also just creates the distance between the two of you, in which you used to be someone that didn't have to be explained. Yeah. Now, you were not in the physics department or even the history department. You were in the divinity school or <laughs> are in the divinity school. Yes. So people of faith, or at least people who study faith, are supposed to have a a larger sure. transcendent language I've to explain these yeah, things. Totally. Did that turn out to be true or not true? <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, well, I'm sorry, I realized I didn't answer your very thoughtful question about why I started writing, which is kind of related. Um, 
because I couldn't say things out loud, I started writing them down because I couldn't quite uh, explain my own reaction. Like, why was I not... It's not that I was just sad. I realized that I felt outrage. Outrage that this would happen to me and that maybe I was much more like the people that I had written about than I expected. And I didn't know how to express any of that because I wasn't totally sure what I would find. Also, I wasn't sure that I would be any good at writing anything that wasn't blessed a history of the American prosperity gospel. <laughs> so, um, so I wrote because I was angry and I was sad and I was really lonely. And because I'm a historian, I didn't honestly expect very many people to read it. So that first attempt at writing an op-ed that said all of these secret feelings and then received the thousands of letters response, mostly from religious people, <laughs> was a total shock. Also really dumb that I didn't think of not putting my email address at the bottom. <laughs> they just like added it with my tagline and I was like, oh, I am now in conversation. Um, so the, a lot of the people that were the cruelest were either fully religious or imagined themselves not to be religious at all. But that, uh, that I should surrender to the fact that I'm the product of an uncaring universe and why bother trying? Or, um, or that God was certainly punishing me for a reason, and wouldn't they, Joe from Albuquerque, like to help me figure out what that reason is? Um, there was a real desire to defend God, I think, from, my, from tragedy. You know, it's just such a basic desire to say that we need to be on God's side when we see the evils of the world. And if I explain you, then I've like solved the God problem. And uh, I thought it was unbelievably cruel that you can tell someone who's got a two-year-old kid and a husband they've loved since they were 14 and say that their loss is somehow part of a divine math that they can solve. I just needed everyone to take a step back and realize like the, the math isn't easy. Like whatever the calculus of our lives are, like it isn't easy. And it's certainly not probably obvious to a stranger. So. Yeah, so then I just kept writing, mostly because I was bummed. And, and then I became really secretly thrilled to meet other people like me and realize that this cultural inability to talk about suffering is actually a really amazing way to enter into our deep humanity. So I just kind of stuck around for the conversation. Now, could you, I want to talk about suffering and who's good on suffering. <laughs> but before we get there, um, yeah. the rage, was it, did it have a, an object? <laughs> <laughs> I was really mad at the I was really mad at the medical industrial complex for a long time because I hadn't I'd, I'd gotten very bad care for such a long time which is partly what led to a stage 4 cancer diagnosis I was really angry um, and I didn't know how to get access to better care because I talk to journalists a lot. You know, I give these historical lectures. I kept giving lectures to rooms, and someone would say, "Oh, you know, my, you know, insert name of famous person had this, and they immediately got care at so and so." And I realized that there was this magical side door that I didn't know how to get to, where people were getting different care. So that was a real struggle for me. I've spent a lot of the last three years just trying to get better care. So I was a little mad about that. Yeah. Uh, now let's uh, get back to suffering, the, to light, light in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all ready for this? <laughs> then there's uh, a balloon drop. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we'll go to misery yeah. later. Uh, uh, who's good? Like, have yeah. there been books that, have, that the rest of us can read? Who's to? good? Mm. Oh, man. The Disney Corporation, maybe. <laughs> I did love. Man, who's good on suffering? I feel like everybody knows someone who's good on suffering that just like shows up, doesn't ask for anything, and just knits in front of you while you're having your hard time. The, the ability to be just pure presence with people. Yeah, I was being too academic. I was meaning a book. Have you I read know. any books? That I helped? didn't read. I'm terrible, but like I read a lot. But the second I got sick, I was like, well, this isn't helpful. <laughs> um, so I, I didn't find. Um, sometimes like I, I love. Like, Jan Richardson has this beautiful book on blessings for the brokenhearted. And sometimes I just find, like, the language of blessing is so good because it's not, a, it's not a language of pragmatism. It's not trying to solve anything. It's just saying, in the midst of the intensity and the complication 
and the absurdity of today, like here somehow is the gift for you. I love that kind of language, the language of in between, I love it. But um, everyone gave me a lot of books about other people dying and I found it really depressing. <laughs> so I, I made a lot of rules like no sad talks after eight, only, only romantic comedies. Yeah, I was on a tight regimen. Lifetime Channel, no? <laughs> It was a lot of Hallmark Christmas movies, did a lot of good work for me. <laughs> now, the, the key thing is that the math, as you said before, is super complicated. Yeah. But I would like to think there's still a math to it. You uh, would, wouldn't you, David Brooks? <laughs> well, we, when, <laughs> when uh, though, now when you were at my house, you were at my house for a panel discussion, as one does in one's <laughs> living room. <laughs> And we, there was this great scientist whose name I've forgotten. Christian Tomasetti. Uh, and uh, he, um, it's about how often cells replicate. Correct me if I get this no, wrong. No, let's do it. Two humanities people, <laughs> let us explain this cancer theory. Let's do it. <laughs> but it's just how many replications there are. Per organ. Per organ. Yeah. And it, it's mind-blowing how often the cells are replicating yeah. and replacing themselves. And you get that many replications just by sheer randomness. You're going to get some bad replications that are gonna go in a bad direction. Yeah. So he's like introducing a fair bit of randomness into the whole equation of this world. He made everyone very unhappy uh, by introducing bad luck as a theory for cancer instead of just saying genetics and environment. Uh, there was just this now, this third category which just has to do with the fact that the body makes mistakes because it's prone to making mistakes. And we looked deeply into one another's eyes <laughs> at your home. <laughs> which is like, I loved everything he was saying. It was such an elegant way of describing the um, absurdity of why one healthy tissue is suddenly unhealthy and there's no family story that explains it. But I think both of us landed um, on a certain distance, a, a gentle agnosticism about the ability to have predictive authority about what other people's lives will turn out. But I think in his case, and I think in yours, not an agnosticism about the ultimate creator of the universe. Yeah, we're for it. Yeah, <laughs> we're into it. If you're into that kind of thing, I am. Um, I think, the, I think the, the gift there was, it's like a two-parter for me. One is, I needed to give up on the idea that there was this direct co correlation between suffering and some other kind of reward. Because like the second you're hurting, all you want to know is that it's going to stop and maybe it's going to get better. And that's not always true. And so other people's desire to tell me that whatever awful thing would somehow have a commensurate good, you just, you know it's not true. Like, you, you know, maybe it might be true for yourself. Like, you could learn a lesson or blah, blah, blah. But, like, you look at your husband and your kid, and you think there's no version of this in which a kid growing up without his mom is as good as if I were there. And so every explanation, it just rings so, like, tinny in your ear that, that like, all the math goes away. But simultaneously, there is such a deep desire to find the beauty in the darkness, and just to say, like if all of my theology could be summed up in anything, it would just be in the words, even so. Like somewhere in there, there is this beautiful thing. And I have discovered this intense love that I couldn't have probably experienced otherwise. I just resent the desire to put on suffering people, one, the desire for them to teach the inspirational life lesson, and then to say, well, like, well they learned it, so it must be worth it. <laughs> I'm like, I think the suffering person wants to say that it wasn't always worth it. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, a friend of ours, I don't know if you know Christian Wyman. Yeah. Uh, so he's a beautiful, oh, I, I think I connected you once a little while ago. Um, he's a beautiful poet uh, and a Christian. Uh, and for him, faith is a bit like, um, a, well, it's a bit like poetic inspiration. Yeah. It comes out of mystery and then suddenly vanishes. I'll tell a one-minute story about Chris. I love telling this story. No, let's do it. So he um, was in Prague uh, with his girlfriend, and a falcon came and landed on the window when he was writing in the kitchen. Uh, and he looked at the window and saw this incredible, blue, beautiful bird. Yeah. And um, he called to his girlfriend, come here, you got to see this. She came out of the shower, dripping wet. And they stared at the bird, and the bird turned its eyes and locked its eyes on Wyman's. And he, he said, I felt like I was peering into centuries when I looked into the bird's eyes just... 
He felt oh. his insides crumble and he was peering into some infinite depth. Yeah. And his girlfriend, understanding the moment, said, make a wish. Oh. And so he wrote a poem about this and yeah. it includes the stanza, and I wished and I wished and I wished and I wished that the moment would not end. Yeah. And just like that, it vanished. Yeah. And so for him, faith yeah. is the coming and the going. Yeah. And faith is not being in a transcendent moment, but using those interruption of life, taking that account into the rest of your life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because that has been the huge bummer of continuing to live, which sounds so weird. <laughs> <laughs> but like, it felt so beautiful. And so, like, like I knew every good thing to love. Like, it, it ordered everything, just like magic. And then you keep living, and there's a weird, you know, I, don't, I don't mean to sound depressing, but like there's the weird poison of living sometimes, like where you feel like it's just sinking into you, and you start loving the wrong things again. And suddenly you're super petty about somebody else's book about a similar topic. <laughs> like you're just being a total dink. <laughs> and like, and, but you had a minute there where you knew what was beautiful. And uh, yeah, I love the idea that it is a kind of, mystery that reorients other kinds of loves, but then you have to like put your boots on and keep walking. And I, I just want to under underline that even so, because um, sometimes people think being a believer or not believer is like being a Republican or a Democrat. Like you just <laughs> choose you're which has the best policies. Not. Like but it's, it's a weird, <laughs> like it's a weirdness. Uh, mu <laughs> of Muslims, there's a Muslim saying, whatever you think God is, he's not that. <laughs> and so I want to keep that mystery. Just about higher and lower loves, you're, you're coming out with another book. Uh, oh, my academic, do we care about that? My academic book for two people? Do we care yeah, about we, that? I, we we care don't about have to it, care about but that. But we care about your attitudes towards it. Oh, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we intensely care about the like, book we itself. We care about my academic. <laughs> well, that was, um, that was like a weird existential choice I had to make when I was, I started treatment, and then you just don't know how long you're going to be in it, how long it lasts, or when you, when you crest and it's downhill. And then it became this really intense questioning of like, well then how do I spend my time? Like how do you figure out what to love if your time is really limited and shouldn't I just quit my job and spend time with my family and force them to look deeply into my eyes 24 hours a day? Maybe they wouldn't like that. <laughs> just... And I decided um, maybe part of living, whatever that means, is to figure out what your best gift is and then keep giving it. And hilariously, the only thing I am good at <laughs> is writing incredibly dense histories of contemporary religious movements. So I was like, all right, that's it. I'm going to try to get tenure at my university by writing my book for 12 people. <laughs> and so I started, launched a study of women in um, the public religious sphere called The Preacher's Wife. But I was so um, sick when I was doing most of the research. So for some of the interviews, I asked these beautiful, glamorous religious celebrity ladies to come on down to the Winship Cancer Center <laughs> and sit across from me. I took out my clipboard with my infusions in. I was like, thank you so much for coming to my office today. <laughs> and these beautiful people were willing to kind of open up their lives. And uh, I feel such a sense of joy to be able to see it published in October because it was an act of hope. And every now and then you get to see a dream come true. So I'm into it. <laughs> Do you think you care about it as if, as much as the first? Well, uh, the, uh, two things yeah. like, yeah, like I, I wrote a book about uh, not caring about material things and and career success, and I check my damn Amazon score every five minutes. So, um, <laughs> com <laughs> complete hypocrite. <laughs> totally. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. I told. I, lo I love the absurdity of it too. Yeah, I mean, hilariously, I think that's partly why I start, started the podcast, because it bugged me that a book would make it seem like it was special for someone to have cancer and then to talk about their tragedy. Because what I thought was more interesting was the fact that it was such an exoticism for someone to be suffering at a young age. And I thought, like, maybe we all need to get over that, and maybe I can get over that if I just surround myself with more people. It made me slightly less petty, I hope. We'll see. One Time will tell. You can do. You can write dense academic prose, but you've also wrote, written a beautiful book in very con common prose. Thanks. Uh, was that? A lot of people can't do that. <laughs> like my father was an academic, and he wanted to write a popular book, and just couldn't get the academic prose out of his mind. And so yeah. that's one question, just about your writing well, style and process. And second, about you had written this quite impactful book for the common reader. 
you didn't do another of those, at least not yet, but you did, you did the academic book. Yeah, I really wanted to keep my job. If I, I figured if I kept living, I'd want that job. <laughs> so <laughs> that was a partly pragmatic choice. Um, I don't, the, my, oh, my most honest answer to writing uh, anything that wasn't what I was trained to write is that uh, when I got sick, I lost my pride. I just figured if I sucked, like, who needed to read it? And that freed me up. And weirdly, this whole thing has, like, I feel like more than I was before. And I don't want that to seem like I'm a hypocrite, that, like, suffering people gain a blah, blah, blah. But I do think it allowed me to have more of a freedom to be more honest. And that allowed me, I think, a greater ability to access some of the things I wouldn't have said otherwise. One more concept, and then we'll go to the floor. Um, and that concept is hope. Yeah. How is... We're uh, for it, aren't we're we? We're for it, yes. yes. We, we like... Yes. <laughs> Uh, yeah. But beyond um, the Barack Obama 2008 campaign, what have you learned <laughs> about hope? Uh, <laughs> well, I've been thinking a lot about hope from your book in the last couple of weeks. Uh, I've been reading it in my Airstream. And, uh, car sickness. No. <laughs> it's car sickness. It's not the book. <laughs> it did feel transcendent. Um, yeah, I think, I think we both agree that like, it's, the, it's, it's, it's a language of vocation, right? That there is a moreness that has to do with transcending the particularity of our, of our absurdity, our mistakes and our good gifts, I think. And that it makes you want to pour into other people's stories maybe more than we might have invested in before. Does that sound right? Sounds profound. Uh, now, uh, <laughs> let's have like some <laughs> questions. And given the um, sensitivity of the subject, I just asked that all the questions be about Pete Buttigieg's debate performance and they <laughs> directed at me. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's go right here, the gentleman in the purple sweater. I can't believe well, there's a microphone coming. I absolutely can't believe this experience. I thought I was coming to hear something about religion. I didn't want to come, but <laughs> after what, I, I have stage four cancer. Oh, hey. I'm 85 years old. Yeah. The only difference between your experience and mine is that I'm at the stage of life where I'm thinking about all the things I did for 85 years and all the things I shouldn't have done, right? Uh -huh. It's a time for reflection. Yeah. But you were young when this happened to you. But exactly the same experience. Yeah. I was angry. Yeah. I was angry at the doctors who had a right to say to this, out of the blue, you got stage four. I went to my regular doctor and I said, why didn't you tell me this? He says, because I don't want to tell you those kind of things. Uh -huh. Those things have scary things and you may live two years or five years. Meantime, it's been 10 years. I should have been dead four years ago, right? Every experience you articulated tonight, every one I've Aww. had, anger. I'm insisting that when I die, I'm going to take some money if I possibly can. I'm going to give it to the university that's taking care of me. They can't have a degree until they spend some time learning how to take care of patients intellectually. But, they, two minutes, what did you tell, four, four seconds? There, this particular brilliant person who's taking care of me, if I see her uh, every three months uh, for uh, 10 minutes, it's a, it's a blessing, yeah. right? I should have more time. There should be some conversation about the inner self, all of yeah. the things you've been talking about. Yeah. So it's wonderful to be Thank here. You, sir. One more question, and I really should sh sit down. But <laughs> You're doing fine. You're doing fine. <laughs> I'm reading, I read a lot now, mm -hmm. obviously. I'm 85, I can play some golf, but that's all I can do and read. <laughs> I love you. And, <laughs> and today, today I'm reading a book um, by a very famous historian, uh, McCullough. Mm -hmm. And he's writing a book, this particular book is about the religious people in, in New England who came to start the Ohio movement out west. Mm -hmm. And they were religious, and they were good, hardworking people. And it was very exciting. And there was one paragraph that one of these religious people wrote back to his friends that I have to read to you, because I was, I'm sending it to my friend who, who's living through this. But it fits exactly. I mean, it's unbelievable. What do you do now what, with this kind of a thing? So this particular very lovely, um, he was a uh, priest, wrote back to his friends. Count the day lost at which the setting sun sees at its close no worthy action done. Is that wonderful? Worthy no worthy action. action. So yeah. at least I can think about 
the good things and the bad, and yeah. the, a good worthy action if all of us did would be helpful in this yeah. whole experience. Yeah, bless you. Thank you for that. Comments? I just love it. I think, I think it presses us into a deep desire for worthy action. I think that's exactly right. We want to make the beautiful things matter. I think that's exactly the right impulse. So bless you. Okay, there's a young lady over there. Hi, Kate. First of all, I love you. I love your work. I met you last year. I'm just, I'm a little <laughs> bit obsessed with you. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> you, talk about, um, you talk about how you used to be shiny, right? Mm -hmm. That sort of feeling. And I think as someone in my 20s, that's definitely a thing. And we've talked about this. I have chronic illness and that sort of thing. But I think reconciling... I really admire the way that you reconcile that strength of who you are and that shiny person that you saw with the physical weakness that comes with living with this kind of suffering. How do you do it? Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, well, um, hey... Thank you. That's very sweet. You're very kind. Um, I think it's hard when our ambitions are usually just a quarter turn away from our gifts. You know, they're ne it's not ever, it's never the opposite. It's just a little, I mean, that's in religious terms, that's what we always call idolatry. It's just, it's a good thing loved incorrectly. And it's hard to like suss out our good things. I, I struggle a lot with that uh, because I'm never quite sure if the good thing is just a reflection of my desire to do something. You know, you, you just go with all the like pragmatic instrumentalist language. Um, I find that my best loves are sorted out in by being around people who are lovelier than I am, and in uh, in looking at my son. He does not care at all if I bought this lovely jumpsuit <laughs> and wore my decorative hair. I mean, I, I used to never get to do anything like this, so this is really special for me. And I think as long as I can um, see that this is an incredible uh, gift of grace, then I probably won't become the monster that I worry that I might become otherwise. You've used yeah. the phrase best loves a few times. Yeah. You I don't know. I'm just like kind of into it. I, that's how I like order it. Yeah. It's an it's, Augustinian yes, concept. So yes. Yes. We're also for that. Yeah. Here, no, you do it. You, <laughs> Augustine no, is the, no. go ahead, do it. <laughs> no, I'm not doing it. We're going to go to the floor. We'll drop Augustine. <laughs> we can them, talk about Augustine. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? I see one in the uh, far end over there. <laughs> I thought it would be good to have a lecture in ancient theology. It all began in the fourth <laughs> century. The... Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's do it. Good evening. In my beautiful language of Dakota, I greet you with a warm heart and a handshake. It's been a hard year for me. My name is Belinda Faye Jo Rencounter Hemie. I come from the land of the Dakota Hunkpati Amataha, a little reservation right in the middle of South Dakota, near the Missouri River. And my people, as most of us know, have been through so much. And I, I still hear comments, not from anybody here, that, oh, your people need to get over it. Could, we bring, could you bring your wisdom to the subject here? So, <clears throat> up here. No, I mean just to the subject of our oh. conversation. Okay, so um, I'd like to share with you that our people, our people have spirituality in the purest form. Ask any of our children at home. Okay, they see the spirituality in its purest form. We don't have to pay for it. You know, they see our creator. And they are the innocent ones. And they are the ones that tell the truth. So... My Tui, my auntie, said, if you get invited somewhere, you make sure you get up and share something. So that's why I'm sharing tonight, that our people are really resilient. And we have a way of life called Wodakota, a way of life, not a religion, not, um, um, how do you say it, that church, it's a way of life, Wodakota. So I come from a beautiful homeland, and I come from a land of spirituality, of mystery, of beauty, of love. And I see that in our speaker up here. She has that all in her. 
and I want to compliment you and thank you for sharing your words tonight with us. Um, I'm a teacher, so I will share some of what I learned out here with my students. So I want to thank all of you for listening to me, and I wanted my friend to say something here, but she doesn't want to, so it's okay. It's okay. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Fadama. Uh, right here in the front, a uh, gentleman in the green shirts. I like to make my mic runners run. Hi, um, this might be a personal question, but I feel like we've already crossed that Rubicon. Uh, are you willing to share your current religious beliefs and did they change throughout your experience? Um, sure, yeah, well, so I, I teach in a divinity school, so most of my job is looking um, at the anxieties of young Methodist pastors and saying, it might be okay, I don't know. Um, I grew up Mennonite, uh, so I, it's quite a simple, lovely, unornamented kind of faith, uh, but pretty basic. I did wonder if there would be, um, like if you look at most Christian movies, like the big plot line will be that the professor went to the university and was confronted by book learning and then rejected it uh, for a, a, a simpler faith. And the truth is, when I was really struggling, most of the deep resources I found, I found by just wandering the hallways and asking poor, unsuspecting um, pastors and nuns for prayer or for counsel. And so um, my school, Duke Divinity School, ended up being the place where I had most of my, my hardest spiritual questions, like, uh, not to be narcissistic, but why is this happening to me? <laughs> and, um, and found a richer language that was beyond deserve and um, and fairness, I just I don't use the word fair anymore. And so I I got to a I kind of dug a I don't think I dug the deeper well. I feel like other people sort of excavated it for me that I was surrounded by. But I think that's mostly just because I work in a place of kind of deeply holy people. I'm a historian, so I feel like I wasn't really ready for any of it. Uh, but in the end, I think I found something richer. It wasn't quite so much of a crisis as it was a sort of a deepening. How do you feel the experience of other people's prayer for you? Oh, yeah, that can be very intense. Um, well, so I, I studied faith healers. I went to uh, Israel with uh, Benny Hinn, the controversial televangelist. Um, those are the kinds of people I'm used to interviewing, so I've seen a lot of very dramatic expressions of, like, prayer at you. Um, prayer whether you like it or not. <laughs> prayer is a test of your faith. Um, and I... I really see, I, I believe in the power of prayer, but I mean that in a very broad way. I think that healing can look like um, a restored sense of peace, a, a deepening sense of God's love for us. Sometimes it can mean a healed body, but I try not to be a little bossy about it. So, you know. Right here on the aisle. Hi, I just have a question about how you, you were Mennonite, so how your parents, um, how they handled it, and how they feel now that you're like in, you know, now in remission, I guess, sort of. Yeah, 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 I know, <laughs> totally. The word for immunotherapy and remission is always like, remission, which is like, we're not sure what's happening. Yeah, though I did appreciate that you did this with your hands. That's totally like, I'm doing fine, it's exactly right. Like, I'm, <laughs> it's exactly right. Um, <laughs> uh, I think everybody, I think it really brought, um, both my parents and my husband's parents are, are pretty faithful people. And so it, I think the most important support systems for them became their churches. They were, I mean, they were just terrified. And I think, uh, I think a parent's love for a kid is so much, it's just so much more than, I don't think I could have known how hard it would be for them to be helpless. And to also feel like they'd finally launched their kid and now she's just like catapulting off a cliff was like <laughs> unexpected. Um, so I think they're much more densely connected with their faith communities than they, they were before. Um, I think because we all felt a little helpless. And then we realized like in the middle of it, most of what we need is just each other. So that's kind of where we landed. Hi. Hey. Um, so we have talked a lot about, and I don't mean this in like a 
in a bad way, but like sort of individual suffering. And I was just wondering if that uh, made you think about like other types of suffering or connected you to that. I just, hearing you talk about like the medical industrial complex, like did you think a lot about that or did you find yourself looking at other children and being like, I, in a different way, being like, I hope they have what my kid will have? Mm -hmm or the things that I want for my child and yeah. feeling that in a different way. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like you feel like you kind of get tapped into this substream where everybody else, like I can't sit in the blood, like you know what you said just gave me shivers because like I can't sit in the blood work room without looking at everybody else and all their kids and wanting every good and beautiful thing. And that's partly I think why I started the podcast is I wanted more language, especially to talk about corporate suffering and, and suffering that it's almost like, I mean, pain really is the sort of, it's this crystalline thing where everybody's pain is so different and yet it's corporate and we, we share one another's. And our pain is so particular to our, to our gender and our race and our community and like all that stuff binds us into stories or excludes us from being considered worthy of other people's care. So I'm really kind of invested in like the way we account for one another's suffering and the way we feel indebted to solve one another's problems. I think I might have been more of a hearty individualist before this. Yeah. Uh, let's go, Chip. I think there's a mic. We'll come to, go to Chip next. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I thank you so much for your comments. I'm over here. Way oh, over hey, here. hi. hi. <laughs> Sorry, you're like right under the light. So, <laughs> where is this mysterious voice? Oh, great. I get Hello. to be God for you a day. You could totally Excellent. do it. Yeah. Um, so you talked about this next book being an act of hope for you, and congratulations. What's your next act of hope? Mm, oh, ooh, that's such a nice, intense, important question. Um, man. Um, I really like, uh, I think it just like it opened up this thing for me where I've been thinking a lot about precarity like, um, so Dorothy Day, this Catholic social justice worker in the 30s, had this lovely word, right, precarity, to think about. Uh, she lived in tenement housings in the slums, and then she thought about poverty, not just as something that people had to get over, but it was an experience of fragility uh, that wasn't always transient. Like, we, it wasn't always going to be something that people would get over. And so I love thinking about... I love thinking about how fragile we are and the way that that actually calls us into greater community and interdependence. So I like, I'm just, I've been thinking more about that sort of like chronic in a fix it world kind of thing. And I think that's where my, my sort of vocation is, is moving. Let's go to the front row here. Hi. Hi. I'm wondering what practices, what sort of spiritual practices or maybe not spiritual practices sustain you now that are sort of go-to things, particularly when times are rough? Mm. My number one go-to, which will be an Aspen go-to, is just to be outside. Almost immediately I found, like, the more things were terrible news, the more I just felt reconstituted by, like, sunlight and listening to the birds and... Um, so being outside has been uh, like one of my big go-tos. The other is uh, just sustaining prayer. Just other people just putting their hands on me and being able to be with me. That makes me feel like, um, you know when someone knows something about you and you kind of forgot it, and when you look at them, like you, you feel it sort of reflected back to you? That's what that is for me. And I feel it too when I'm just able to see other people do beautiful projects the way they reflect the humanity of others to them, that feels like a kind of superpower that I'm watching. Um, that, that makes me feel like any pain I'm going through is also just part of a bigger, a bigger human experience and that maybe the biggest thing is to get over the shame of being fragile in the first place. Is, so. is there a stage four sisterhood or brotherhood? Is there? Oh man, colon cancer is not usually for my demographic. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't find a rich community there. Um, <laughs> But I, I am, uh, you know, I'm, I'm surrounded by a lot of, like, faith projects. And so it does sort of help me watching other people serve. It makes me feel, you know, like, pain makes you feel like a bit of a narcissist. Like, this is the only pain that's ever been. <laughs> so watching it helps me kind of get outside of myself again. Let's take uh, one more right over there. 
Kate, hey. I have such a huge heart for you. I just thank you. Thanks. Um, and I'm Jovian, by the way. Hey. Pleasure. Hi. Um, you've experienced life in a way that some of us will, some of us will not, right? It's all different. But there's been a invitation, I think, I've experienced in my own sickness that you're invited into when you can see life differently, when you come so close to recognizing it won't always be. Yeah. And so I just wonder, in this vein of hope, yeah. what do you hope for us? Yeah. That now that you've seen things a little bit differently, what do you hope we do differently, we yeah. think, and perhaps we feel? Oh. I wish there were more language for us. I wish there were less shame when we suffer. I wish there were more spaces in our culture to allow suffering to be unexplained and certainly not weaponized against us. I wish there were spaces where we could abandon the meritocracy for a minute and recognize each other's humanity. And I think the more I find like little bits of language that other people give me, the more I think like there's room for all of us in there. I'm just sad that it took like this experience for me to see that in other people. Yeah, thanks for your question. Okay, I usually try to sum these things up with a quip or an observation, but uh, <laughs> I have nothing to say, Kate. <laughs>